Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice. In her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful once again for your word and its timeliness. Lord, you're a God who knows us and whose desire is to set the captives free. Only you, Jesus. Only you. Would you come? Would you pour out your Holy Spirit today, Lord? And set us free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty to the captives. To restore sight to the bronze blind, to declare the year of the Lord's favor to the world. Come do your work. We're ready to receive you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So honest question as we begin to our time together, how many of us here know that we should pray? That's something we should do as Christians. Wow, some of you need to go back to Sunday school. You don't know that, huh? Okay, that we should. We absolutely should pray. Next honest question, though. How many of you struggle to pray? You can be honest here. We're all in the same boat. Like, we, we know we should, but we struggle to pray. So often prayer feels like this, right? It's like... Dear God, I'm going to pray what this other person has prayed. I'm going to kind of cheat off of them because I don't know really what to say. And so I pray for your eschatological presence in my hermeneutical mind, right? And it's just like, what does it even mean? I don't know, but someone else said it, so I'm just going to repeat it because I want to pray bold and powerful prayers. 
We think that's what prayer is. But for, I think, most of us, what we, especially as we're growing in the Lord, here's what we think prayer actually is. We think God is this big observer in the sky who just is there to take notes. He's like a waiter. Like, here's what I'd like next, and here, here's what I'd like to go with that, and can I have the, the string beans instead of the peas? I don't really like peas. And so we're just asking a lot of God specifically. We're saying, this, these are the things that I want, and this is how I want it. And sometimes God answers, and sometimes God doesn't. Am I striking a chord with anyone here? Like, it feels that way. It feels like he's the, the vending machine in the sky, the genie that we rub the bottle, and then we should get the things that we need or want. And if you've ever struggled with any of these things, I want to encourage you that God has you here on purpose. And that that purpose is to develop a much bigger picture of what prayer actually is. Because prayer is many things all at the same time. First of all, it is two-way conversation. Go back and read the, this, the account of Samuel's call to ministry in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and see if you can't see and very clearly tell that God is the one who is speaking to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, here I am, Lord. Speak, for your servant is listening. But he's not just speaking. He's also appearing to Samuel. He's there in human form. Go read the passage again. God is clearly communicating in, in a way that is call and response, right? But the point of it is not simply so he can show us that he's a speaking God. The point is he wants to develop intimacy with us. God's design for us is to know him intimately. The word that John uses is abide, like a vine and a branch, a branch that comes out of a vine. If you cut the branch off, the, vine, the branch dies because the vine is the source of life. He says, Jesus is our vine. We are the branch. We need to abide in him. It is organic. There's a sense of we can't live apart from him. And I'm not asking for hands, but I'll just raise mine. As one who has tried to live apart from the vine and slowly withered, I know what that feels like. It never works. It never works. He wants us to learn to abide, but he also wants us to learn to have our heart changed by his, right? So when you're abiding with someone, that, that, that's not just organic. It's a, it's a love term. It's an intimacy term. As you live longer with whether it's friends or a spouse or, or family or parents, your, de your, your desires, your wants, uh, they, they start to actually commingle, right? So when Kristen and I first got married, her taste in, in movies was these French foreign films. You had to read subtitles. Who wants to read the entire time you're watching a movie? Don't raise your hand. No encouragement. None. Okay? Like, so she, she still kind of likes those, but you know what? We, we, we thought like, hey, let's, let's kind of meet in the middle. That wasn't good either because the stuff that's in the middle of like, X-Men and French movies is stuff nobody wants to watch, right? And so we've learned to actually begin to understand and appreciate one another. Our hearts have changed. And that verse, Psalm 37, 4, which we have written inside of our wedding band, says this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's not a, a, a verse that says, hey, if you do right things, you ask God anything you want, he's going to give it to you. No, no, he's saying, as you delight in me, I am going to give you my desires. Amen. And as I give you my desires, I will fulfill them as you pray. Amen. It's a unity of heart term but it's, it's also a heart-changing reality. You see, we think prayer simply means this, right? This is how we pray. And can I tell you, that is how we pray. But it's not the only way we pray. Prayer is a lifestyle. God wants us to, be a, to learn to pray without ceasing. Do you spend your whole day like this? I don't. But he wants us to learn to be in communion with him and to learn to listen to him throughout the day so that whether we're praying for one another at church or we're praying throughout the day while we're driving or we're praying before the day gets started on our knees in our quiet space, wherever it is, we can learn to discern his voice. And you know what we call that when God speaks? Prophecy. Prophecy which again is, is a word that scares some of us who've been around the church and seen that abused before. We're not talking about writing more of the canon of scripture. We're talking about when God takes the truth that is timeless and applies it specifically to you, giving a word of information or knowledge or whatever. God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, I wish, Paul says, I wish that everyone could prophesy. You know why? Because when unbelievers walk in the church, 
and they receive a specific word from God for them, they'll fall to the ground and say, surely God is in this place. We worship a living and speaking God. We do not worship a book. We do not worship a God who existed 2,000 years ago and did awesome things back then, and we hope he'll do awesome things in the future. We worship a living and speaking God who did awesome things and will do awesome things, but is doing awesome things right now. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. So I've missed you guys the last two weeks. I really have. There's something that's beautiful. Can I be honest with you? There was a season of our existence as a church when I went away and I didn't miss all souls. And that hurts me to say, but that's just the reality. This is not that season, friends. I missed being here because I miss what God's doing here. And I love what God's doing here. But the two weekends I was away, I was, it never works out like this, but I was at the Dunamis Conference, and then I had a class for my doctoral, which was on the Holy Spirit. So I had two Holy Spirits in a row. So if I seem jazzed up to you, there's a reason, okay? Like, I'm overflowing with Holy Spirit right now, and you're about to get it, okay? So praise be to God. At the Holy Spirit weekend, what we did was we practiced the prophetic, we, we simply, we, we were taught it, we asked God for it, and then we broke up into small groups. And we said, okay, let's actually listen to see what, if the Lord has a word for one another. And I've shared about this in the past, and some of you have been like, oh my gosh, we've even done this at some of our sheepdog meetings. You're like, uh, I'll just pray something else, because I'm not, you have to take the risk. You have to take the risk if you want the reward. So I get teamed up with two guys I've never seen before. I don't know them from anyone. We introduce one another just with names. We say, okay, let's pray. First guy's name was Sam. And can I tell you, as soon as we started praying for Sam, I saw a word over the top of his head, worthy. I saw it. I can't tell you how I saw it. It's just there, worthy. And I said, Sam, I think I'm seeing this word worthy over your head. Does that mean anything to you? And he starts bawling. Because this is a man who never felt like he was good enough. He starts to cry about his relationship with his dad and ache because he never felt worthy. To the dads in the room, can I just encourage us, us? We have a vital role to play in the lives of our children. I cannot tell you how many people have dad issues. How many folks I sit with and interact with and pray for who have dad issues and therefore they have God issues because God calls himself father and we struggle to say that because we struggle with our own dads. If you're one who has dad issues, can I encourage you to realize today is your day. Today is your day. God wants to set us free from those things to bring healing just like he did for Sam because when, when Sam heard that his father did not follow his father. That his father in heaven, his heart was actually for him and he actually thought the truth that you are worthy because you're mine. And when he heard that come from someone's mouth who didn't know him from Adam, he received it differently because he knew it was him. That's what swimming, moving in the prophetic looks like, friends. It's humble and it's humbling you're not always going to get it right. Speaking of which, Jason. Um, so another guy during ministry time, I start praying for, right? Someone, a friend brings me up to him, says, this guy's new to the church. I'm like, all right, God's going to do something awesome here. And he's like, this guy's name's Jason, and then introduces me to Jason's wife and Jason's kid, and, and then uh, and I'm like, I, I can't remember his name, so I need to pray for him. So I'm like, what's your name again? Is it Tim? And he goes, no, that's my dad's name. right? What if I didn't say that out loud because I was scared? You know what God keeps asking me? Will, are you ready to be a fool for me? Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. So I, he says, Tim, I start crying. And right away, I'm thinking dad issues because I just had several guys with dad issues and it's kind of in the room, right? And so I start praying without listening. Mistake. And it's not landing. 
And I'm like, what's going on here? So I pause. I say, hey, is, is, this, is this hitting you? He goes, no, I had a great relationship with my dad. I'm like, oh, man. Right? I'm like, okay, Lord. Well, and he, and he starts talking about his dad in the past tense. I said, what do you mean you, you had a great relationship with your dad? He goes, my dad died four years ago. And I'm like, okay, have you been able to process some of that? He goes, yeah. And then the Lord has me look down at his son. And I hear the words in my head, well done. So all of a sudden, I get this clue as to what God was doing in that moment. And I start to pray God's words of affirmation over this dad who was looking for the affirmation of his, of his earthly dad but didn't have it. Am I a good dad? Who's gonna tell me this? And I spoke those words over him and he received them in the Lord. So you just, you see, like, I made a mistake. I didn't get it right, but I didn't stop because I wanted to lean in. I want, I want to be used by God, but it is not me. It's not me. I know nothing. I'm simply learning to listen and then to step out and take the risk, right? And so all the things we just talked about, these two examples, you know what we call that? Prayer. Prayer. It's learning to communicate two ways with the Lord and as he speaks, leaning in and taking the risk to step out. Did you notice how I said it though? I didn't say thus saith the Lord. Right? Please don't ever do that. I will call you out. Right? We hurt people that way. We're not in this to hurt people. We're not in this to claim that we are perfect in hearing from God. We must stay humble. I think I heard. Does that mean anything to you? And sometimes they're like, no, it doesn't mean anything. It's like, okay, well, let's go listen again because we want to hear. So today, listen, that was a very long introduction, but I wanted to give you a little taste of where we're going. As we lean into this concept of prayer, as we're unpacking the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I want you to begin to understand that God is doing something in our midst that's going to take you outside of your comfort zone, but is going to equip you the keys of heaven. If you're willing, let's dive in together. The last couple weeks, we've been hearing from first Tommy, right, and then Scott. Both of them brought awesome words from God for us, continuing to unpack this, this movement of the gospel, right? The gospel goes out in word and in deed that goes from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Because Jesus rose from the grave, the good news is going to go out, and everywhere the good news goes, it is a message of hope. People are healed from diseases, and demons are cast out. Do you remember that? That was all throughout Luke. We see it all throughout Acts. Everywhere they go. Two weeks ago, Tommy brought a message about not being in the way, but being in the way. A little play on words. That's a good one to remember, right? Like, we don't want to be in the way of what God's doing and so quench the spirit, but we want to walk in the way of what God is doing. And so it's a good heart check for us. And then last week, Scott talked about Barnabas, remember, the son of encouragement, and how Barnabas was a great example of what not quenching the Spirit looks like, even when those around us fail us, like Mark, John Mark did. And Barnabas was like, hey, I'm going to give you a second chance. Don't worry about it. So this willingness and readiness to live on mission. Today, we're going to dive into this as our theme. Prayer is how we access spiritual victory. Let me read that again. Prayer is how we access spiritual victory. So two points, the power behind the persecution and the power of earnest prayer. First, the power behind the persecution. Our, our text for this morning starts off with this line, Herod laid violent hands on them, on the apostles, right? Herod's violent hands. Who's Herod? Well, the Herods are a family, right? And they're a family of rulers. Think of them kind of like mayors, they are the mayors of uh, the different regions within Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Those different regions had different Herods. At one point, there was Herod the Great. We'll talk a little, bit about, a little bit about him in just a moment. But think of them as appointed by Rome, the Caesars, right, to rule on their behalf. That's, that's who the Herods were. They were somewhat uh, Israeli in their heritage, but they were mixed, and they, they, all, they did not live according to the culture of the Israelites. Why do I share this? Well, because the people of Israel did not want them as king. Those who were faithful to Jesus, to Yahweh, rather, did not want them as king, and they saw them as in, in, uh, 
in bed with, for lack of a better term, Rome, right? They, they were in cahoots with Rome. So here you have Herod, um, who puts James to death. Now keep that in mind as I give you a couple other insights as to what's going on in our passage for this morning. First, notice the echo of Jesus in Peter's story. Did you see it? Jesus was arrested at Passover so that they might kill him. Peter's arrested at Passover so they might kill him. Anytime you see recapitulation, the same story lived out again, please hear these words. If anyone would follow me, he or she must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. Come after me. Peter is living out his calling here. And God is up to something bigger than what Peter can see. We're going to get to see some of it this morning. But anytime you see that, let it catch your attention. Don't just gloss over it. Second, notice also the fear here. Again, a recapitulation of what happened with Jesus, right? But also what happened with Peter and John. So here you have in verse 4, there, there are four squads of four soldiers. Four soldiers for each of the four watches, which is total overkill, right? So you have this one guy, Peter, in prison, who's chained to two guys, who's in a cell with a guy outside the door, but that's inside of another cell with a guy outside that door, and every four hours, they change all four guards. Do you think they were concerned about Peter getting out? Seriously, right? Well, why would they be concerned? Well, because just a few chapters later, Peter and John were in prison, and an angel came and opened the door, and they were out. They've already seen this happen. Notice that even when there are miraculous stuff, there's miraculous stuff happening all over the place, you have these folks that just continue to deny and try to suppress and control it. They're not interested in the truth. They're interested in control because they're afraid. Where's that happening in you? Not interested in the truth necessarily. Please don't hear that as a smack. It's not. It's an invitation. Where are you interested in control? Because I'm better at keeping myself safe. No, you're not. You're, you're denying the very thing that God is doing to make you safe. It's not just what happened with Peter and John, though, in Acts chapter 5. It's also what happened with Jesus. Do you remember when the, the stone rolled away and Jesus kind of went out and he walked around for 40 days and appeared to everyone and 500 men, which means probably more like 1,500 people at least saw him over that 40-day period. So we're not talking about a bunch of guys that are like, hey, the 11 of us, let's make up this story and tell everyone that he rose from the dead. They don't actually try to prove the resurrection ever. Peter just assumes that everyone knows because everyone does. Brothers and sisters, Acts chapter 2, Peter says, you yourselves know about this Jesus who was attested to you by miracles and signs who rose from the grave. He doesn't say, let me give you my defense as to how this actually happened. Everyone already knew. Don't miss that. But what did the officials of that day try to do, even though everyone knew? Matthew chapter 28, 13 said, the high priest told them, lie. Tell them that the disciples came, stole the body away. Give them a physical, concrete answer that tries to eliminate all of this craziness, all the miracles, so that we can stay in control. Are you following? Okay, I don't want you to miss this. This is kind of the key point for us this morning. We're going to unpack this a little bit more. Don't miss the inheritance that's in view here. We talked about Grandpa the Great, Herod the Great, right? He's the guy who, remember, the wise men come to in the, in the birth story. And when the wise men come, they deceive Herod because Herod wants to actually put Jesus to death when Jesus is born. And they, they go back another way so they don't have to interact with Herod. And you remember what Herod does? He goes to Bethlehem and he slaughters every baby under two years old. Because I'm going to get, I'm going to get that Jesus. Can I, can I just say out loud what hopefully all of us are thinking here? That's not normal. That's, that's not normal. Right? That's, that's not just like, wow, that guy was angry. That's not anger. I've been angry before. I've never killed dozens or hundreds of little babies. Ever. Ever. I've never used my power to do that. That's not normal. Yet, we interact with the Bible stories. It's like, oh, yep, and Herod killed all the babies, and that's just because he was a bad dude. He was more than a bad dude. He was a demonized man 
who is doing the work of the devil. How do I know? Look at the generational sin that happens in his family. He kills all these babies, then his nephew kills, or son rather, kills John the Baptist, and then his grandson kills James and intends to kill Peter. That's not normal. That is inherited generational sin. It is the spirit of murder passed down. Now listen, some of you right now are like, all right, I'm out. Uh, this spirit generational stuff is really weird to me. I'm not sure I'm getting this. Okay. So let's put the spirit of mur murder to, to the side for, for a second. What is it in your family? Anger? Can you look up your family tree and see anger play out? Shame? Shame is, oh, we don't talk about that in our family. Shh, no, we don't talk. Fear? Anxiety? Depression? Friends, we've started because of our cultural worldview, because we've been taught by a culture that wants to deny God. This stuff is just, it's all physical and it's all normal. There is nothing normal about that. It is the work of our enemy that wants to destroy us. And today, today, God wants to set us free. And so if you're coming in here and you had an answer to it, and listen, there's not one family I've ever met that doesn't have generational sin, ever. And so if you're like, ah, oh, I can't think of, of mine, I'm not sure you're being honest. Can I challenge you? You already know the answer. And you probably have several. It doesn't mean that there aren't wounds involved. It doesn't mean there, aren't, there isn't counseling that would be necessary. It simply means this is not solved by counseling. This sort of stuff. You, you, know, you know in our country we have this thing when someone murders someone, they're like, he's pleading insanity. By show of hands, how many people here have met someone who's murdered someone who isn't insane? Do you see the point? Murdering is absolute insanity. And we call it insanity because we don't want to call it what it actually is. Not just sin, friends. Demonic. It is of the devil. Can I encourage you to realize the reason why God has us here this morning is because of this. We all live with family sin that we think is just a part of who we are. We just have to live that way. That's a lie from the pit of hell that wants to keep you from actually experiencing the fullness of God in your life. We don't have to live this way. It's normal to you because you've always lived this way, but you don't have to live this way. That is sin passed down from one generation to the next that is tied to probably lots and lots of trauma, but is also tied to the meddling work of the one who's constantly shooting arrows at the people of God, tempting them to believe that he is the one who thinks like I think, meaning Satan, about you. It's a lie. It's a lie. And the way we know that this is a spiritual thing, right, is the way it plays out in our, in our text for this morning. If, if this was just a physical thing, right? If, if this stuff was not generational sin passed down, how would God answer? If it was just physical, he'd either send some counselors to Herod, right? And then he'd send an army to get his people free from prison. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? Our second point. The power of earnest prayer. He actually sends his people to their knees. It's a spiritual battle, friends. It's a spiritual battle. And I love that word earnest. It means fervent, persistent, unyielding. Because they're battling for Peter here. And they don't even really understand what or why. They just know that they're called to do this, this night watch, right? They're called to stay up and pray and pray and pray and pray. It's what, the, the, what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus when he says this. This is how we go to battle. You know that passage that talks about the full armor of God? the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, and the sword of the? Spirit. Which is the? Word of God. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And what's the very next verse say? 
See, we don't memorize enough. Everyone stops there that we wield in our persistent prayers. The word of God, which is not logos, meaning written word of God, not that it can't be that, the word of God, rhema, meaning spoken word of God, that we wield in prayer. Let me translate that for you. While we're praying, God speaks to us, and we pray what we've heard, and we win spiritual battles. Did you hear that? Do you want that? Yes. I want it. I want more of it. It's never going to contradict his written word. It's never going to do that. But friends, if all we do is read the written word and don't expect God to speak to us, we've misunderstood what real relationship is. He wants us to know him. He wants us to be united to him in our hearts. He wants us to abide in him. He wants his word to abide in us. But he wants us to learn to discern when he is speaking, to take the risk to step out and to watch as lives and hearts change around us. Amen. Peter's experience of this is pretty clear, right? It's the 11th hour. He's at the very end. Peter's the one who's going to be put, put to death. He's chained, he's bound, he's sealed, there's no escape. And what does God do? God sends an angel to break his bonds. His shame is covered, and I love God's sense of humor here. Did you catch it? It says he, like, whacks Peter on the side, right? Like, hey, psh, get up, right? Like, it's real, it's real. And the whole time, what is Peter thinking? I, I'm having a vision, right? It's a dream. Well, even if it was a dream or a vision, that would still be prophetic. That's the very promise that God made in Joel 2 that was poured out on Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit's going to come, and your old men and your young women and, and everyone in between are going to dream dreams, and they're going to prophesy, and they're going to receive words from God for the sake of his mission. So what does it look like for us to actually live into that? Well, from the beginning, please don't miss this, because, again, the temptation is to think this. Well, that's just weird Acts stuff. And God never really worked like that before, so why should we expect him to do that? God worked like that from the beginning, friends. From the beginning. In Acts chapter 15, when he was calling Abram to himself, what did he have Abram do? He fell into a dream. And there he went into covenant with Abram and said, no matter what you do, I will always be your God. If you mess up, I'll take the punishment. Do you think that mattered that Abram heard that? Who is the fulfillment of that promise? But Jesus, right? From the beginning, he's been communicating. What about Acts chapter 10? We just spent several weeks unpacking Acts chapter 10. Who has a vision? Peter. Who else has a vision? Cornelius. God speaking to them. And if those visions didn't happen, we wouldn't happen. Because Christianity would be a Jewish thing and only a Jewish thing. It would not have been open to the Gentiles. But God made it very clear in Acts chapter 10 that it was for the whole world. God is speaking to us, friends, and he wants us to learn to listen. I'll give you another example of what happened uh, this past weekend. I was praying for a young man, and uh, I had no idea who he was, didn't even know his name. It was during a, uh, like a worship and prayer time, so we're going around and just ministering to folks. And, and I just come up to him and said, hey, can I pray for you? Sure, sure, sure. I put my hand on him and say, come Holy Spirit. And right away I get a vision of this guy. I kid you not. He looked like a hobbit with a backpack on, walking down a lane. Now listen, I'm not that guy, right? Like, maybe I am becoming that guy, but I, I've never been that guy, right? Like, it's like, really? A hobbit god? Like, I don't know. I don't know, really? And then it hits me. It's not about him being a hobbit. It's about him being on a journey. And God being the one that's going to direct his steps. And so I tell him, I said, I think I see a, a picture of you on a journey. And God's saying, you don't have to be afraid. He is going to direct your steps. Right away, the guy starts crying. He said, I came into this weekend with one request. God, will you direct my steps? That's our God. I don't even know his name to this day. And yet God knows him, saw him, and spoke to him. What kind of church do we want to be, friends? What kind of people do we want to be? What kind of children do we want to be? 
God invites us to more, even today, friends. What about this church's experience? Well, first of all, they do a night watch. What, night watch. What's a night watch? A night watch is when they stay awake all night long praying. Can we start doing some of those here? Can we? You know, God, God's pretty big on the whole sacrifice thing. You know why fasting matters? Because we're sacrificing. You know why night watches matter? Because we're sacrificing. And we're not earning something. God's not saying, earn this. He's saying, I want you to give up more. Surrender more of yourself, and I will fill you there. So they're staying up all night and praying, and God literally answers their prayer, and they do the same thing that we do. First of all, who's the only one that gets it and believes? The kid, Rhoda. Don't miss that, for those of you who are teens and or younger. Don't miss. God loves the faith of the younger generation. Because you're so much more willing to accept this is how God moves and you're not bitter and, and kind of turned off from God because you tried so many times and it didn't work the way you thought it was. God loves to work through the younger generation. Amen? Amen. But you, then you see the older generation. Listen, who's in that room? All the leaders of the church, right? All of the spiritually mature at that time. All of the ones who are the adults who should have known better. And Rhoda comes in and says, Peter's at the door. And they're like, no way that happens. Right? He, you're, you're out of your mind. And then what do they say? Oh, it's probably his angel. In other words, they, this is how they reason. God can't answer our prayer. There's no way he was going to answer our prayers there. It's most likely that Peter died instead. What? It's most likely that God did the exact opposite of what we asked for? How often do we go to prayer, friends, and we think, God, I'm asking you for this, but I know you're going to stab me in the back. I know you're going to give me the opposite because you just love to do that sort of stuff. Right? Friends, we've got to come to the table and be ready to give our whole hearts to the Lord, trusting that he's going to direct and redirect as he sees fit, but not asking and holding back. When we ask and hold back, what's the word that the Bible uses to describe that? lukewarm or double-minded. And he says, when you ask something and you're double-minded, you're never going to get it. He wants us to love him with our whole hearts because he says, when you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. So this church is doing the same thing that we tend to do but are learning not to do. And what God does, even when they don't believe, he still gives them what they've asked for. Praise be to God. God is faithful even when we're not. But please notice, who else is faithful? <laughs> Peter. <laughs> he keeps knocking. <laughs> like, how, how long was he out of the door? I don't know, but he just keeps knocking. He's not going to stop because he wants to get in, but he wants to get in for a purpose. Friends, how often has God been knocking on our hearts and we have not actually opened the door? Can I tell you, two year, uh, last year at Dunamis, I shared this story. Some of you know it. Um, I was there, and there was a second night we were there, and dunamis is a conference that's all about Holy Spirit power. Dunamis is the Greek word for power, right? So we could, went down to Virginia Beach. We did this, this conference, which was just four days, five days, um, and we just saw God move with power, right? But that first time down there last year, I'm in bed, and, and I wake up because there's loud banging on the front door. And I think, oh my gosh, who's, who's here? It's the middle of the night. Like, well, who's banging on the door? But then it doesn't continue. I'm like, oh, maybe I, maybe I was dreaming. That's probably what it was. So I go back to sleep. And then a few minutes later, I wake up because there's really loud banging on the door. And I'm like, what on earth is going on? And I'm, I'm about to get up and go downstairs and wake up the house because there's absolutely someone at the front door. So I'm sitting up in my bed, and I hear these words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open up the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And I knew what God was saying. He wanted me to open the door of my heart. He's not going to break it down. He wants us to choose him. And when I opened up the door and gave up my right to control my image, to control what it was going to look like, would I be embarrassed? Would I get it wrong? It didn't matter. When I opened up the door, the next several days at Dunamis were absolute Holy Spirit fire. This year at Dunamis, two weeks ago, George Schaff, my brother, lies down in bed and he hears some knocking. And he's like, what is that banging? 
Like, he gets up, he searches around. No, he thought maybe George got locked out, the other George got locked out of his room, and he's trying, gonna, gonna try, go try to help because he's a gentleman like that. But he goes back to bed, and he hears banging again, and he thinks, oh my goodness. I remember what happened with Will last year. Like, is God banging on the door of my heart? And then he looks out the front door, and he sees a policeman banging on the door across the street from him. <laughs> now, there was a natural explanation for that banging, but can I tell you, there's more to that story. Because even though there was a policeman banging on the door across the street, God was absolutely banging on the door of George's heart. Amen. And the rest of that experience for this man became Holy Spirit fire. Amen. So if you've not asked George's story, ask him. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I want you to see here, though, too, that in doing all of this, part of God's purpose in, in ministering to us and meeting us in prayer is so that he can comfort us. Don't miss this. This is the story of the very first martyr, the of the apostles, that is. This is the first disciple to die. And Peter comes to them, and he says this message. I know the one who holds the keys. He doesn't use those words, but that's what he says. Tell them what just happened. Peter explains his story to them, and then he turns and he says, now go tell James, who's the head of the church, and everyone else who isn't here. Make sure everyone hears this message. We know the one who holds the keys to every prison. The one I was just in, and even death itself. Amen. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh grave, is your victory? It's swallowed up by the cross of Jesus Christ. He wanted them to see that. He wanted them to believe that because the reality is they were going to need to start using those keys, not just to help each other get out of prison, but specifically and more importantly, to help all the people around them that they were ministering to get out of prison. I've given you, Jesus says, the keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth is bound in the spiritual realm. What you loose on earth is loosed in the spiritual realm. He has given to his followers the authority to exercise the keys of the kingdom. And he wants us to learn to do that together, friends. The reason is simple. The war has been won. It's over. We, we go to battle, but friends, the war's been won. There's no getting around it. Darkness has lost. Death has lost. All false powers have lost. In fact, Colossians 2 says, because Jesus rose from the grave, he put to open shame all the spiritual authorities and powers that were usurping or trying to usurp his throne. He shamed them all by showing there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Redeemer. His name is Jesus. There is no other, friends. There is no other. And when we have him, we have the one who literally death bows the knee to. Where is that fear inside of you, friends, that says God's waiting for me to figure this out, to carry it, to make it better? when all he's actually waiting for you, for you to do is seek him with your whole heart. And then listen, as he reshapes, remakes, reforms, and empowers you to follow. Amen. Prayer is how we enter into that spiritual victory reality, right? One of my favorite passages of scripture, you probably know it by heart, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Do you know that one? Did you, did, 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 you, did you skip over that part? In all things through prayer and petition, which is crying out, supplication, crying out, present your request to the Lord. It's that, he's talking about communication. And the peace of Christ that transcends all understanding will guard. Did you notice that? You're talking about army language here. Guard in the spiritual realm your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is not a game, friends. God is calling us to attention. 
And he wants us to see from the beginning in Philippians chapter 4, the first command there is, who knows it? Mm, close. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is near. And when he is near, his victory comes with him. Therefore, be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer and petition, you get the rest. He wants us to live with Holy Spirit, heaven, peace. He also wants us to live with comfort and with love and with freedom. This comfort, remember, he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who is the comforter. If your name is comforter, you're probably pretty good at it, right? And if you're, you're God and your name is the comforter, you're the best at it. So why so often do we hide ourselves from the one who is our comfort when we feel discomforted? Is it not because we've been holding on to the lie of fear in our lives? That he's not going to do for us what he's promised to do. That it's going to hurt too much. Beloved, it already is hurting. And God wants to set you free from it today. The spirit of love, we already talked about that. John, 4, John 15, abiding. Because when you abide, you begin to actually develop intimacy. And as you get more intimate, you hear the word of your Savior in a way that you never heard it before. Can I tell you, I never used to get visions, ever. I never used to see the words or get the pictures. But as I have been leaning in and giving God my yes, I see visions all the time. The gift of prophecy is for the church, friends. It's not just for your pastor. It's not just for the spiritually elite. It's not just for those people. It's for these people. God calls all of us into that level of intimacy because he wants all of us to be set free. He quotes Isaiah 61 when he begins his earthly ministry. Do you remember what it is? I prayed it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor, to set the prisoners free. Where are you imprisoned? Where have you inherited that, friends? Do you hear him coming after you to set you free today? I want to tell you one more story, and then we're done. At Dunamis this past uh, session, two weeks ago, they practiced this earnest prayer. They called it soaking prayer. Soaking, it's just sitting. For 90 minutes, you can sign up for a prayer session and soak and let, let a, someone lead you and let someone intercede for you. And you just go and you listen and you go wherever the Lord takes you. And can I tell you, uh, I was a part of that for someone else and it was tiring. I was the recipient of that one time and it was exhausting, exhausting. Because every time I thought it was done, the prayer leader kept saying, let's go back in. I'm like, no, please stop. It's, it's too much. But can I tell you, I went in to that prayer session thinking that there wasn't much to work on. <laughs> I didn't talk to Kristen beforehand, right? <laughs> Just kidding, love. She's my biggest cheerleader. Do you know why? That's why it's funny to say that, because there's no one who roots for me more than her. There's no one. Yeah. So I went into that thinking, okay, I've done so much work over the last year in my heart there's probably not much that God wants to do here. Can I encourage you to realize whenever you think that way, you've misunderstood who God is and who you are. So we go into this prayer session and they just say, hey, let's, let's, let the, let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Let's let him lead. Okay, let's do that. So she's like, let's just be quiet before the Lord. And she says, come Holy Spirit. And right away, I get a vision. I'm literally in heaven. I can see the clouds, right? Not that there are clouds in heaven. There are not. But I saw clouds. And I see this hand reaching down to me. And I know it's God. And then the words that come out of the prayer leader's mouth are these. I want you to imagine yourself going up to heaven and grabbing God's hand. He's going to take you on a journey. Wow. Wow. That got my attention. She says, okay, let's go back in because she had to bring me out so I, we can talk about this, right? So let's go back in. I'm like, all right, I can't wait. I go back in. He starts walking me down this path. And I see all of these moments in my life that were pain and shame moments from my childhood. 
And a lot of them had to do with my mom and my dad. And, and we didn't stop at any of them. I just looked at them, and they were kind of fuzzy because I'm like, Lord, didn't we take care of these? Didn't we deal with this stuff? And he's like, almost. And we just keep going, and then all of a sudden we stop, and, and, all, and I see in front of me my mother and my father and their, their little kids, and they're playing. And there's so much joy in their hearts and on their faces. And I hear him say to me, I've got them, they're gonna be okay. And I realized I was carrying around so much weight and fear when it comes to my aging parents and their health. And I just found out two days before that my parents had COVID and my mom who has COPD, I was like, ah, oh God, what's going on? And he says, they're gonna be okay, I've got them. I feel like he gave me a picture of heaven for them. And I thought, wow, this was so awesome. I'm glad I came. And I told the prayer leader about this. And she said, okay, that's wonderful. Let's go back in. I'm like, oh, there's more. Okay, let's go back in. And so we go back in. And she's leading me down this, or he's leading me down this path. And I'm seeing a lot of these moments that now I'm not a kid anymore. It's when I'm a teenager. And then when I'm a young adult. And it's all these points where I'm just overwhelmed with shame. I'm like, Lord, haven't we dealt with these things? And she says, what is God saying to you right now? And I hear him say, you are forgiven. You are set free. You are my son. I love you. And I say those things out loud, and I'm crying. I'm receiving it. He's like, I, I do not. I'm not ashamed of you. You're not a monster, which was the big lie that I believed my whole life. You're a monster. I hear those things, and I'm like, Lord, haven't we dealt with this? And it's, yes, we've dealt with this. And she says, now, I want you to look to the Lord, and I want you to tell him whether or not you agree with that. And that nailed me. Because I realized it's one thing to know what he says is true and to believe fully that he thinks that way, set free from that lie, hallelujah, it's quite another. When I hold on the right, to the right to hate myself without ever knowing I was doing it because the things that were done to me and the things that I did were shameful, horrific. That's who I am and I know it. And God said, no, it isn't. And today, we're gonna do something about it. So I'm crying. And she says, okay, ask God what he's gonna do about that. The difference between what he says and what I believe. And I kid you not, I'm sitting in a chair like this, my hands out like this. She's right in front of me praying. There's a prayer person over here. And I see God in my vision reach down his hand into my heart all the way down to the bottom and pull up this root of shame that I went like this. I thought I was gonna throw up on her, right? It felt like he was pulling something out of me and all of a sudden, I was free. I was free. That lie was gone. The shame was gone. Can I tell you one of the lessons I learned? God is our healer, we know that. But God wants to heal in person, not in theory. God is not interested in us believing facts out there. He's interested in being the one that applies those facts to our hearts and our lives. He wants to heal us in person. And he uprooted my shame and then called me to bless that little boy that he never saw as a monster that he always loved. And can I tell you how he, he asked me to do it? It was really weird. She said, put your pastor hat back on. And now go baptize that boy. In my vision, he was like seven. But all of a sudden, he became a baby. And I'm looking down. This is weird, I know. I, I'm, I'm looking down at myself as a baby. And I realized how much I had 
really loathed myself. I have to put water on the head of this baby and proclaim blessing over him. The whole time I'm feeling my heart healing as I'm declaring the truth of God over this little baby. And then as we do at All Souls every time, because I said amen, and they said hallelujah, and they're crying, and when I'm crying, I'm like, we're not done. We need to sing Jesus Loves You. And so we sang Jesus Loves You over this little baby, and then I gave him back to the Lord. Now listen, some of you right now are just like, man, this is really weird to me. And can I tell you, it's really weird to me too. This is not, I'm not used to this stuff. This is, but I want to get used to this stuff. I want to get used to more and more stories of God taking us down those paths of healing where he's the one who is, is doing the healing. I've been to counseling multiple times. I've been through deliverance multiple times, but I never got to that place until God brought me there right, right when I was ready. That's my story, and I'm sharing it with you, friends, because I don't want it to be mine alone. I want it to be your stories. I want generational sin because, listen, self-hatred runs in my family. Abuse runs in my family. Shame runs in my family. And I know I'm not alone. But I have freedom today that I've never had before. And Jesus wants that for all of us. So here's the challenge. Are you willing to pray earnestly? Where is Jesus knocking? Where are you experiencing persecution? Whether that's shame or fear or anger, some place that you are stuck in prison in your soul. Where are you experiencing this? Will you make the time? Will you invite others? Do you notice I didn't just do that on my own? I could not have done that on my own. Will you invite others into that? And will you persist until the victory is won. Let's go back in. Let's go back in. Let's go back. Even when you're exhausted, let's go back in until God says, we're finished. It's, for some of us, it's gonna be one time and we're done. Did you notice in my story, I basically put together about 20 years of experiences in one little pericope, one little story. It's taken me that long to get to this place. And I know I'm not done. And I know we're not done. Will you lean in? In your disciple groups, will you lean in? Will you take the risk to share here? We're training up all of our disciple group leaders in deliverance and inner healing. What I just described was called inner healing. We're training up all of our leaders in all of this, and we want to train our whole church in this. You know why? Because if we have a whole church that has experienced this healing and this freedom, and is trained to help others, you know what that's called? Revival, friends. Amen. It's called revival. And God wants us to actually believe it. It starts with you. It starts with you. Don't let another day go by. Let me pray for us. I'm gonna invite the worship team back up on the, on the platform. As they are singing this last song, I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward as well. Because here's what I know generational sin is true in all of our lives. And because it's true in all of our lives, we all need freedom from it. Perhaps the, the first thing that God's calling you to do this morning is just take this step. Just come forward. Even if you don't know, I don't even know how to ask for prayer, but what I know is I need it. Praise God. Praise God. Holy Spirit, will you come right now? Lord, we ask for a fresh anointing right now because there is a spirit of fear that wants to drive us from you, and I bind him in Jesus' name and tell him to go where Jesus sent him. You have not made us slaves again to fear sons and daughters that learn to cry out to our Abba. Daddy, heal us. Daddy, make us whole. Daddy, provide for our hearts in ways that we don't even know how to ask. 
I thank you, Lord, for story after story over the last two weeks, example after example of, of so many ways that you've shown up in our lives, Lord, and we're asking for more. But God, what I'm asking for right now is a special anointing of your Holy Spirit to fall freshly upon those who know that you've been talking to them this whole time, that they need healing, that they need freedom. Maybe they're afraid to ask. Maybe they're afraid to seek you. Whatever it is, Lord, would you be at work in their lives right now? Would you drive away fear and confusion? Would you give them the strength, Lord, to open up their hands and surrender control? And God, would you let today be the day where deeper levels of freedom are experienced, where the curse of generational sin is broken, where the lies, Lord, are replaced with the truth. So I pray right now in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over All Souls Community Church. I cancel the curses that have been spoken over and lived into from generations above. And I declare that Jesus, your blood is sufficient for us. Yours is the victory and we stand in it today. I bind the enemy, the accuser of our souls in Jesus' name and tell you to be quiet. Lord, and I ask right now that you'd bring to mind anything in any of our hearts, Lord God, any place where we need to seek forgiveness, where we need to let go of bitterness, where we need to give up control, where we need to confess sin. Would you show us, Lord, that there's nothing in the way of what you're about to do? We yield to you freshly today, Lord. We want to be free. We want to be free, Lord. And that is exactly what you've planned for us today. Where the Spirit of the Lord is.